All righty. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IFMA Toronto and South Central Regions web series. My name is Sarah Clare. I'm the Vice President of Programming and Education, and by day, I proudly work for Infrastructure Ontario. I'm your virtual moderator. We welcome all of our members and non-members, or as I like to say, future members. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the IFMA YouTube channel afterwards. Thank you to the IFMA team for making this presentation possible, especially to Lisa Martel, our chapter administrator, Kay Pays, our vice president of programming of communications and membership, Lisa Gushu, our director of programming, and Bernice Lilly, our chapter president and fearless leader. The topic of COVID and the return to work is certainly a hot one, as companies are making really tough decisions on how on what re-entry is going to look like, we're thrilled to partner with Hayworth for today's presentation. Today's topic is the importance of the facility manager in uniting culture and behaviors in the new normal, whatever that is. This includes considerations for employee well-being, organizational culture, and transforming the floor plate for re-entry. We will dive into this today. Today's presentation is approximately 30 minutes long, and we're leaving lots of room for active discussion. We'll open up the Q&A to you all where you can type into the chat function on your screen. Before I conduct our speaker introductions, I'd like to pause for a safety moment. Everyone plays a part in stopping the spread of COVID. We strongly recommend that for those of you that are on the front lines are following PPE and cleaning product safety guidelines that are aligned with public health authority guidelines. This means providing the workforce with up-to-date education and training on the use of PPE and disinfecting practices. Workers who require protective clothing and equipment require training on how to put it on, use and wear it, take it off correctly, and of course, disposal. As we learn more about the virus and research develops, so do the guidelines. So please keep checking back. Now it's time for our speaker introductions. Nicole Clancy is a business development executive at Hayworth. Nicole works to assist with driving collaboration, optimizing real estate, facilitating knowledge exchange, supporting both individual and team-based work patterns, supporting a multi-generational workforce, which supports a technology lifestyle and attracting and engaging employees. And she's an experienced resource that can help bring you what your space supports your needs. Nicole brings with her a wealth of design and AD experience. Nicole was an interior design workplace strategist for 12 years and still holds her accreditation as a registered interior designer. Nicole is heavily involved in several organizations and has held leadership positions in many associations, including, and most importantly, IFMA. John Scott is a senior workplace design strategist at Hayworth. John has an extensive workplace design experience with a wide range of client and project types over the last 22 years. His background includes interior design for prominent A&D firms in both Chicago and Grand Rapids. In both positions, John developed strong expertise in the areas of workplace strategy, organizational culture, and design development. As a knowledge leader on Hayworth's ideation team, John's focus is on the translation of workplace research into conceptual design recommendations. His role is to help clients understand the linkages between design and business performance and to explore how new ways of working can impact cultural and organizational change. And with that impressive resume, I will now hand over the presentation to John. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Well, hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well, uh, staying safe. This is our short little program over the next six hours. Oops, just kidding. Next 30 minutes. This is our return to workplace. This is just an overview of uh, the importance of culture, what culture is, and maybe some of the implications or behaviors upon entering what some are calling the new normal, I like to maybe think of it as the new abnormal. So before we get into that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, just to do a quick little overview of this presentation. Oops, Nicole, are you on? I'm on. Uh, 
stand as facility managers in our new normal or abnormal, as uh, John called it so so truly. Um, we wanted to to just have a little bit of a different discussion here today. There's a lot of discussions being had about the physical environment. We've certainly been involved in those, but one aspect uh, that Heworth is incredibly passionate about is culture, and it's one of the things I really enjoy as part of my role is talking to organizations and helping them understand how culture influences the behavior of their teams. John's going to walk us through today a better understanding of what culture is, how it affects your teams, and how it affects our abnormal, normal environment right now. As facility managers, you're in a really unique position in that you really work with individuals on their very basic needs, including PPE, all the way up to the organization and trying to balance the needs of that overall organization. Because let's, let's, um, look at it. If if we don't have businesses that are running, we won't have jobs to do. So you've got a very, very key responsibility and culture certainly falls into how you can make that more successful. So we're going to, John's going to take you through that today. Excellent. All right. So first up, I always like to start with what is culture, right? To just to sort of lay the f foundation or the groundwork of uh, what organizational culture is. And so really culture is a culmination of three aspects. It's the values, the assumptions, and artifacts. So when I say values, it's it's what a company does. It's its mission, it's how it represents itself, it's how a company acts, it's its processes, it's actions have, of, uh, that inform what the employees actually think. And it's the artifacts, it's what a company represents, its products, its publications, sometimes even its architecture can all be an artifact of one's culture. And so really all three of these together really make up the personality of an organization. So just like all of us have a unique personality, so do each organization and each company has its own unique personality and each uh, unique culture. So we have a really fantastic partnership with an organization out of the University of Michigan called the Competing Values Framework. Uh, and this group has been around for over 35 years and have done a, has done a lot of work with Fortune 100 and 500 companies. But before they uh, are where they are today, they started as a consultancy group where they were working with different organizations on helping them to grow their market share. And when they were working and, and doing some of this work, they realized that different organizations had different dominant, dominant, dominant characteristics, different personalities. They were led by different types of leaders and they're all pursuing results in different ways. And at times, some of these, uh, these cultural aspects were, were conflicting or competing against one another. So they developed this framework that has been around for, again, a number of years and is a, is a really strong, important business model. Hayworth has the exclusive rights to use this for design planning purposes, and so we're really proud of it. And, and I'll show you a little bit more of some of the work that we've done with this. But just to start us off on what the competing values framework is, this is, this is the framework. This is what's been around for 35 years. Initially, every organization in our world is made up of all four of these culture types. No one company is one color, right? You need to have all four. So each of these are uniquely different, but they're also uniquely important. And we really rec we, 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 we understand that recognizing an organization's culture is actually the key to unlocking performance, innovation. Uh, it helps with change management and also with, with worker satisfaction. So if we start with the first culture in the upper left, the collaborate culture, this is all about this group, this culture is all about doing things that last. So it's about developing relationships, developing trust. It's uh, developing uh, a, really a mutual understanding and, and they look at it as a long-term development of the human capital. So if you had to think of two words, this is sort of your Cliff Notes version. If you had to think of two words to really remember this culture, it's really around knowledge and community. That's really what drives and, and, and motivates them. The competing value or the opposite of collaborate is down in the lower right-hand corner is what we call compete. Compete is all about doing things now. It's about speed, results, profits. It's about winning, right? It's all about short-term performance and getting things done very quickly. So for them, it's profit, it's speed. So these two sometimes are at odds with one another because you have groups in blue wanting to move quickly to see results. And then you have groups in yellow wanting to take their time, make sure that there's a group consensus, that everyone's on board, that everyone has had an opinion and there's tension. And so all the, so we'll oftentimes work with the two and say, if the blues can leverage, leverage the relationships that the yellows are so good at developing, 
the blues can actually penetrate and go further, faster, farther. At the same time, the blues can help the yellows actually speed up and make decisions faster, which can help them as well. So uh, there's one interesting dynamic. The other competing values between red and green. Red, what we sometimes also call hierarchy, is called control. Control is all about doing things the right way. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. So when it comes to the right way, it's about quality, efficiency, standards, protocols. There's You have to follow the rules. So they're, they're all about taking small incremental steps to remove risk out of the equation. And if there's a process that is, is 10 steps to, to create something, they wanna find a way to maybe get that down to nine or maybe even eight steps. And so that, uh, that's sort of what drives and motivates them. And the other side of that is create. Create is all about doing new things. So for them, they love risk because it, it unlocks the door to potential new opportunities and breakthrough innovation. So for them, they love risk because it says, hey, what if, and let's try something new and different and let's experiment. So for them, it's really about growth and innovation. This is what drives and propels uh, these, these, uh, these groups. And so all four of these are again, uniquely different, very, very important, but essential uh, in all organizations. So let's take a look at some company examples that exist in our world today. So again, no one, no one organization is a pure culture type and most ex express actually multiple cultures. So usually there's a dominant culture and sometimes even a secondary culture. And then within those companies, you'll actually have subcultures. So you'll have your, your HR, your marketing, your sales, your engineering, they will all have their own unique culture type as well. But for the overarching, these are some different company examples that we came up with. So first up, Harley Davidson. I think, I think this is a really great representation of this culture because for Harley, Harley Davidson is all about the journey. It's all about being together on the open road with your brothers and sisters, right? And it's, it's, uh, they're, so, they're so into this uh, experience that they actually will tattoo the logo on their skin, which is pretty impressive. But for them, it's all, you know, they provide the vehicle and it's about you creating the experience of, of the open, you know, the, the, the journey and, and doing things together. So that is really a, a great connection to that collaborate culture. Compete. Really thinking of more of a financial services, share writing, you know, Uber is a good example of a compete culture type. They were one of the first early adopters to the ride sharing program, but, but are always jockeying for position and, and pricing. And, and uh, you know, I think they're one of the ones that a lot of companies look at is, is trying to, to measure things in a very short term performance piece. So they, they are kind of a really good example of a, a compete culture. From a control aspect, a lot of manufacturers tend to be more in that red group. So Toyota is a really a classic example of a control culture. So for them, it's all about really uh, manufacturing elements or, or products uh, just in time, right? So it's, it's trying to remove waste out of the value stream and make things incredibly efficient. So they have the Toyota Lean model and uh, a lot of different things that a lot of other manufacturers have adopted based on what Toyota has done. And then finally create, Again, because of what they're trying to do, I, I chose Tesla. You know, there's you could put in Apple or Google, some of the others, but Tesla's, you know, they're they're really they're out there, you know, thinking literally outside of the box, doing things in different ways, and uh, um, I think they they they're not, they don't do just one thing. They're they're looking at all aspects of of creating different products and services for for us. So I think that's kind of a unique element. I think Nicole wanted to also touch upon one other thing here, Nicole. So where would you say facility management based on what John just shared with us? So we've taken a stab at it, and although it's not defined, uh, we feel that facility management really falls very strongly into these two categories. As facility managers, it's very important for you to be able to be involved um, in the community aspect of the organization. So you fall into the, the collaborate group and that you need to meet all of those needs of the individuals. As well, definitely on the control side of things, you have to work on the efficiency of the overall business and making sure it meets its needs. And falling to the left because we see facility management as more internal. So you're yep. meeting needs of the organizational internal needs as opposed to the other side, which tends to focus a little bit more on external. So that's just a little bit about how your group typically uh, would tie in. Again, it's a dotted line, so it does change from time to yep. time. Yeah. But you can see that they're starting to, there's a little bit of all four, just sometimes more of a dominant one side or the other. So that's, thanks, Nicole. 
So I also want to include some, some examples of leaders um, because oftentimes the most effective leaders will actually have highly developed skills that are very congruent with their, their culture's quadrant. And so I, I, I thought of some different types of people who, who I feel have a, a strong connection to each of these. And so I, the first one for collaborate, this one kind of was pretty easy uh, for me, but I, I chose Fred Rogers, you know, Mr. Rogers. This is, he would probably say, uh, you know, if, if he was still with us, I, I'm not a leader, I'm your friend, right? So, you know, of course for him, he was all about, won't you be my neighbor? So lived in a neighborhood. He was always sharing stories and teaching and, and had knowledge. And I think he's just a great representation of what a leader for a collaborate culture might be. So then on the opposite side of that, the compete, I, uh, of course, I just got done watching the, uh, uh, the Last Dance uh, docu-series on, on ESPN and, and chose Michael Jordan. I think he's really the ultimate competitor and, of course, has won six world champions and really pushed his teammates to really go beyond their skill set and, and, and excel in a way that, you know, to win at, no, at any means necessary. So he certainly is, is a high competitor, one that has uh, obviously uh, done very well, but uh, I think represents this culture really well as well. And then from a control piece, I was trying to think of a, uh, you know, a strong uh, governmental official uh, who I, I feel, because government, uh, military, they kind of all tend to work really well in this red, red category. That's why it's so often, you know, cutting through the red tape. But I chose Queen Elizabeth because I feel as if there's so much, uh, there's, there, there's, there's so much formality and, and rules and regulations and it's, it's very proper and there's, uh, you know, she's been, in, she's been ruling the UK for 68 years. And so I think with, just with that, the stability of leadership and, uh, you know, it, I think that's, uh, that's pretty wonderful. I think the most creative thing she does is probably figure out which, which type of hat she wants to wear for different, <laughs> different outings, but a very, I think, very strong representation of a, of a control culture. And then finally, in the create side of things, I chose, I chose Elon, Elon Musk just because I think he's been in the news quite a bit uh, recently, of course, getting uh, his creative use of naming his child, which we won't go into. But, um, I, I, you know, I think he's definitely, he's one that is definitely unique and thinking differently. And his, his whole philosophy, his vision is to actually change the world and help humanity, which is pretty cool. I mean, if you want to change the world, you got to do things that you know, outside of the box. And so I think he again, represents a really strong green create uh, leader. And then I thought, you know, let's just keep this train of rolling. I think there's television shows that are actually have a connection to each of these cultures. And so I started thinking about what would be some good television shows that would connect each of these. And so the first, the first one that really popped in my mind, and maybe you're thinking the same thing, maybe not. Um, I chose Sesame Street for collaborate. You know, it's it's based in a neighborhood, right, on Sesame Street. And uh, really, you know, it, it began in 1969. And this show is really all about education and communication. I mean, that's just essential when it comes to this culture. So I really felt like, um, of course, they have a huge yellow bird, which also connects really well to the culture. But I just thought it was a great show to connect back to, you know, this, uh, this about building relationships and, and trust. On the opposite side of that, the compete, I went with The Price is Right, right? The, the classic game show that's been around again for a, a quite a long time. But this entire premise of the show is, is to beat the competition, right? And, and in, in order to win cash prizes, uh, vacations, vehicles, you know, dishwashers, whatever. But uh, it's great. And I, it's, you know, when, when their names are called, they get so excited and they don't walk down the aisle, they run, right? Because it's all about hurry up. So I think it's a really great, uh, another great example of uh, compete uh, culture. Then on the red side, this one really jumped out at me as well as being pretty obvious. And so you have law, you have order, which the two itself are a pretty uh, controlled hierarchical element. But this show really deals with aspects of the criminal justice system and follows a very controlled, predictable model. So you can tune in halfway through or three quarters of the way through, and you know that there's been a crime, there's been an arrest, there's, uh, there's going to be a court session, and there will be a verdict. And it may, it may at the end, surprise people, but there's always that... Uh, that uh, definitive uh, sound that the show makes as well that uh, tells you what's going on. So that I think is another good representation of a control culture. And then the create side, I struggle with this one a little bit, but I came with this one. I, I don't know if you've ever seen Black Mirror. Um, if you've seen it, you know, if you haven't, you, you might not, but this show features what's called speculative fiction with dark and sometimes satirical themes that examine modern society. 
And so it's, uh, it's definitely one of those that makes you scratch your head because each episode is different. And so you just really never know what you're going to stumble upon. So it's definitely something that's outside, like literally outside of the box. And so uh, I chose that one. And then, you know, I said, let's just, I, I don't want this to stop. I'm going to keep going. This will be the last one, I promise. Man's best friend. I think there are dogs, there are canines that also have a connection to culture. So why not? I chose, uh, again, I started thinking about different different dogs and I chose the Golden Retriever for collaborate. Of course, Golden is in the, the name of the dog, which connects really well. But, you know, Golden Retrievers are a favorite family pet. They love people, always super happy. Um, you know, they just, they just love, they love their people. Um, then the, again, on the opposite side, I, I used to use the, uh, the pit bull and, and people would get upset at me and hiss and spit when I would say, ah, oh, they're really great and friendly until they, they chew your arm off. So of course I had to change. So I chose something different. I chose a greyhound. The greyhounds are the fastest of all the dog breeds. They actually can run up to 44 miles an hour. So, uh, when it comes to speed, of course, you know, I think that's a, a really great representation of, of that breed. Then on the control side, I chose the Border Collie. So this guy, this is the working dog of this breed. And you know, they, they've got to keep those sheep in order, but look at those eyes, look at the intensity. If, you're, if you've ever been around Border Collies, they actually will try to herd you or even small children and herd them. It's, it's hilarious, but they are such a incredibly intelligent, smart dog. And uh, you know, they are all about, they get pleasure out of doing that work. And so for them, there's a, there's a right way to do things. And then finally on the create side, I just took a little bit of liberty here. We really, you know, we don't know what dog breed this guy is. It's uh, he or she is just different and that's great. So uh, I think that's one of the beautiful things about this culture is that really it's, it's out there, anything works and it's just, uh, it just makes it very fun and unique. So I promise that's the last one. Get back to our, uh, our, our culture and our design applications. We actually have created uh, specific design applications for each of these cultures because we believe the the physical workplace is actually the greatest greatest expression of an organization's culture so each of these cultures will actually prefer to use spaces in different ways to work to connect uh to collaborate and and, and so forth and so from a yellow collaborate they prefer spaces developed like small neighborhoods allow them to be more intimate and allow them to have connections when they need to spontaneous connections but uh but again allows them to really represent and celebrate the uniqueness of who they are from the compete side of things, because time is of the essence, they need to get connection, they need to get information from one another as quickly as possible to in order to make decisions. And sometimes that even means having real real time data being fed to them so that they can have the up to date information so that they can make the decision, pull the trigger and go, right? So for them, again, it's all about doing things now. From a control aspect, again, it's it's a very efficient use of the footprint of, of the real estate and it works really well with the architecture. They love panels, it allows them to delineate space, carve out space, have a, a place to focus and, and to uh, develop a lot of the processes that are very important, a lot of standards that they need to work through. So their spaces are, are, are very uh, uh, more formal in nature. And uh, again, a lot of the, the circulation and, and some of the different amenities are, are very centralized and, and, and more predictable. And then finally, the create side of things, they love the, as much flexibility and adaptability that you can build into the space as possible because what they're working on today, this week, something might change and they may need to shift and change direction and they want to perhaps readapt or, or alter their environment to support a, a new way of thinking or a new way of working. So the more that this group can, can alter their space, the better. The idea here is we're trying to prevent putting a green group into a red solution or a yellow group into a, a red solution because it really doesn't support the way that they interact with each other and really what they're trying to produce. Yeah, so try to take a look at those pictures and see if they're what your organization is sitting in and think about the culture based on John's description and how it fits your organization. Yep. The same can also be true with uh, collaboration modes, right? So each of these cultures will actually interact uh, and share knowledge and use different types of spaces to, to connect with each other. So again, for groups in that yellow collaborate, because they are such highly social creatures, they want spaces that allow them to sit, relax, and be very comfortable because it's about building human relationships. And so they, 
rarely will, will reserve a, a conference room to socialize. They may use that to spread out their pizza boxes for their lunch buffet because lunch is like the greatest time of day for them. <laughs> but for them, it's about finding a place to connect and, and, and really, you know, uh, sharing, uh, sharing stories and, and uh, really building in those relationships. The compete side of things, again, it's they're working, they're collaborating, they're brainstorming, they're, they're, they're really doing everything all at the same time. And so they may go into a, a small war room. Uh, they're really doing it all now because they don't have time to go and reserve a space and then come back and work. And it's, we got to get it done now. So for them, they may do everything in one type of space. The control piece uh, is all about what we call presentation, right? So for them, it's one or two individuals actually sharing out to the masses new updates, uh, information on changes, uh, you know, it's uh, the new standards or new operating procedures. This is a highly effective way for this group to share information. And then from a create side, because of the brainstorming and strategic thinking that they're trying to do, they need spaces that allow them to uh, not be distracted, but also be able to put things up on the wall, uh, find connections and start developing sort of that uh, more of that displayed thinking and, and conceptualization that is so important when it comes to developing new ideas. So a lot of this can be found in a recent white paper that we developed uh, back in May that really talks more about each of these culture types, what makes them different, what makes them unique, but also a lot of around their collaborative uh, spaces as well. So if you're wanting to, the link over on the right hand side, uh, uh, you can go to our, our website and download the white paper for free. So it's just a few pages long. But uh, again, if it's something that you're interested in learning more about. So really the rest of this uh, piece today is really thinking or focusing on the return to workplace and what some of the cultural implications and perhaps some key challenges might be for each of these cultures. And so we'll walk through each of the cultures and talk about some of their key challenges. So again, for the collaborate, they're committed to their community and their work. Because they're so used to being uh, close to one another and, and socializing frequently, the physical distancing might be harder for this culture uh, and, and, you know, trying to set up a new, new norm. And of course, uh, you know, as they try to transition back into the physical workplace and the ability to not to not even physically uh, be adjacent to one another or support one another through friendly hugs or high fives, it might seem strange or odd to this culture. However, uh, I feel like their unified behavior really produces a strong organizational image. And I think together they actually may cheer on this new change in the workplace and actually help be cheerleaders and, and build stronger relationships as a result of COVID. So thinking about it, some key challenges from three unique perspectives, the employee well-being, the organizational culture and, and transforming the floor plate. The first Obviously, you need to address the loss from the workplace change and find ways to encourage people to talk about their emotions and feelings. That's going to be really important for this culture type. From a cultural standpiece, uh, really involving people early and often who will be affected by the change and the planning and implementation of a potential new workplace. And then when it comes to transforming the floor plate, again, really maintaining the appropriate distance for conversations among occupants might be difficult for this culture. but but still need to provide opportunities to celebrate together because again, they, they celebrate all things. Hey, Sally got a new cat. Hey, let's, let's throw her a, a cat shower, which because cats love showers or water. Um, but anything that allows them to come together is really important. So just still maintaining and being able to find ways to do that. From a compete aspect, again, they're all about speedy and profitable outcomes. This, you know, because they are, they're, they're focused on the, the pursuit of success they actually, I believe, will be quick to learn what works best for them and the business and what can be left behind. Um, I think what also is gonna be really important is universal quick connect, quick connect and adaptive technologies will really be important for this culture as they, as they develop a, a new way of working. And then dealing with a new workplace, uh, this actually may provide a new obstacle for this culture to, to quickly drive through. And at the same time, create a renewed motivation uh, to pursue new opportunities that could result in increased profitability. So they love a challenge. If you tell them you can't go straight, they will say, we will go over, under, or around. We'll find a way to do this and we're going to win. So this could give them new motivation, but also an opportunity to, to be more profitable at the same time. So again, from three, these three uh, perspectives, provide quick face-to-face -face or new virtual interactions while adhering, of course, to physical distancing restraints and taking too long to adapt to the new workplace could be a potential hindrance of speed because of course 
this is all about maintaining a competitive edge, that could be that could lead to some underperforming teams if if they take too long to adapt. And then finally, allow for more space between coworkers and high density applications. This culture tends to have used to have a more dense densely populated uh, uh, floor plan. So uh, obviously making sure that there's the appropriate spacing, but also maintain the ability to quickly connect with one another to gather that necessary information. From that control piece, which again, they're all about internal processes and seeking, seeking stability and mastery of their work. Having a remote work policy in place will really be essential. Certainly, you know, moving forward, uh, a lot of organizations have recognized that they will have a percentage of employees still working from home for an extended period of time. So making sure that they have that sort of policy in place uh, as a way to foster a sense of security and performance uh, for people and teams, that'll be really important. Clear rules and guidelines that will help people move seamlessly between different work settings. So again, if, if they, those are individuals who are working from home part-time and then also going into the workplace, they'll need to understand what that looks like. So because this culture is all about planning and creating systems and processes, this will help to ensure compliance. And then of course, consider that people tend to sometimes overwork when remote to produce more results. So it's just making sure that they manage that appropriately certainly if this remote work policy is, is something new for the organization. So some key challenges for this, this culture, complying again with new regulations and rules of workplace distancing uh, while adhering to professional standards can actually help to reduce work stress. Making new internal work processes routine and employing new technologies on a larger scale. And then smaller, more frequent meetings may help with, ch with changes and new expectations in the new workplace. These groups tend to meet frequently and for a long period of time. If they do it smaller, shorter periods of time, that can actually help them be more, more efficient. And then finally, the last culture here, create. Again, as a result of COVID, this culture could experience and realize a disruptive innovation, which is an innovation that creates a new market or value network. The, as they pursue breakthrough innovation with a wide array of, of experiments, the new workplace could provide new opportunities to do just that. And because of their fluid idea generating nature, they may accept changes in the new workplace as an opportunity to explore how human relationships and the use of new technologies used together can actually lead to new breakthrough products and services, which again could cause radical changes in the marketplace. So for this culture, they may see this as a, a reset or uh, a pause of, of starting something new now uh, that, that they could perhaps have a, a, a lot of influence on. So from employee well-being, again, offering new spaces that stimulate and inspire people to think creatively, uh, creatively uh, while providing a sense of belonging will, will be very important. Finding ways to hold idea sharing events in the new work setting, uh, again, while speculating about emerging opportunities, and then reestablishing a flexible and open workspace that empowers new product development in smaller groups. So then we also, we, we, we took a step ahead, you know, we looked into our crystal ball and got all the answers and said, here's what the new workplace might look like based on some of these cultural design implications. And so from a, again, from a collaborate uh, aspect, we, we sort of highlighted three specific elements that, that might be, so this might be a, so it's the, uh, the new normal or the, the post COVID. So the number one is really representing the use of photo or, or personal artifacts for worker identification and engagement opportunities. Uh, number two is really looking at providing post-it notes or post-it pads or assigned individual whiteboard areas for larger common areas. And then three, uh, for kitchenettes, maybe find ways to make the kitchen safe with individually contained areas for personal artifacts such as coffee mugs. From a compete culture, uh, you know, the number one's looking, really pointing at planters or the planters at the end of, of workstations can actually help support physical distancing while at the same time helping to clean and filtrate the air. Uh, number two is really representing providing uh, cleaning stations at, uh, for all shared spaces. And the third point here is really provide more opportunities for virtual conferencing. From the control side of things, the first one here is, is the orientation shift uh, to help with physical distancing with proximity to with neighbors. Just changing the orientation could actually help, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, providing a little bit more safe distancing. Uh, the second here is, is provide cues with carpeting as to where to navigate in the space for quick, for quick interactions with safe distance. And then the third one here is more enclosure, perhaps. Maybe it's a, a higher panels, stack on kits, 
uh, screens, what have you, uh, to help again with, with physical distance. And they, this culture would appreciate that. And then finally, the create side of things. Really, the first one here is, is uh, removing guest seating options at the, at the individual workstations and perhaps replacing with plants or other accessories to, rem to promote physical distancing. Uh, the second point here is looking at increased embedding and, and, and externalization opportunities with individual assigned whiteboards. So instead of having a shared space, people may want to have their own just to, again, keep things uh, clean and sanitized. And then the third point here, really increase spacing for individual seats that are used for team brainstorming sessions. So again, that was, that's an important aspect of this culture. They may wanna just provide a little bit more distancing when it comes to doing those type of activities. So with that, I think we will open it up to Q&A. Excellent, thank you both so much. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of a firing round right now. However, Nicole, John, you can pass it off to each other Sure. Complement each other. I will leave that to you. So, um, outside of an excellent communication strategy, what other actions can companies and facility managers do in partnership to provide comfort to tenants that have yet to return to their office? So, one element that um, successful facility managers have been doing, we, we, again, being a global organization, we do get exposures to what other companies are doing globally. And one thing is creating champions. So, just like when we do a transformation in a move, we end up with teams that end up being champions. They understand the guidelines, the rules, and the communications that put in place, and they share that back and champion within their team. That definitely means that the responsibility is not all on the facility manager and they have a team working and in some cases policing that along with them. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I would also say, you know, having, having a, a, a strong cleaning and sanitizing um, um, campaign and communication piece just to help ensure really what it's, what, what it, all it comes down to is, is ensuring that you're providing a physically safe and a psychologically safe workplace for people to come back to. People need to understand that it is safe to come back to, but from a mental standpoint, mm -hmm. it's okay for me to go back and leave my home and travel to work and go to the workplace and, and still be effective and not, of course, um, you know, put myself in, in, in any, any situation that may not be, it may, it may not be good. So I think having that, Thinking about how to create that safe, physically safe and psychologically safe environment is, is really key. Certainly. Thank you for that. And just a reminder, everyone, um, we do have the Zoom chat option, so you can send me some questions on the fly here. Um, I have a question from Jane Slate at Optimal Performance Consultants. How can we bring the facility manager human resources operational health and safety and ergonomics together to bring about a healthier return over the next several months? You know, one thing that uh, I've seen and I've talked to many organizations about their, their return to workplace strategy. I think some, some are taking some different approaches, but certainly again, a lot of it comes down to communication and, and being more visual. And so some are actually uh, choosing to create videos or demonstrations that, others can watch and understand what is being expected of them or what the new normal might look like. So uh, one organization in particular is actually leveraging their executive leadership in doing different skits. And so they'll have one executive leader demonstrate the, the right way to do things. And then unfortunately they'll have another executive leader maybe demonstrate the wrong way to do things. And so they, they're having a little bit of fun and, and adding a little bit of humor, but I think just, being, because we are such visual creatures, um, being able to demonstrate it visually. And, and I think that will help to, in all aspects of whether it's, you know, facilities, HR, ergonomics, I think that will really help people um, feel better about some of these changes that are going to be in place, but, but also what some of the new expectations will be uh, in the new workplace. Certainly. I really like the idea of um, executives and the kind of role play. It makes it seem a little bit more um, personal and yeah. also to see them actually um, supporting it for sure. Right. Um, outside, we've talked communication and we've talked about um, a 
like a clear plan in terms of having um, cleaning practices in place. Um, what are you hearing from your conversations with different companies and your networks as being facility managers' top priorities to prepare an employee for reentry to the workplace? And this could be whether this individual works in anywhere from an office to a different kind of asset, maybe a more industrial setting, for example. Um, are you hearing anything in that regard? What are you hearing through the grapevine? Yeah, it's really, it, the, the, it's this, the full spectrum, you know, some, some are, are looking at it as, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to clean things and, 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 and create, uh, de-densify the, the floor plan and, and make things safe that way. Others are taking a more extreme approach and, and reevaluating their real estate footprint and knowing that in the future, again, they may not have a, a one-to-one -one ratio at work. And so maybe with 30, 40% of their, their employees working from home, they may not need as much space as perhaps they do today. Others are, are reconsidering perhaps uh, moving to the burbs, the suburbs where uh, their employees don't have to interact with as much public transportation because I think there's a lot of fear uh, and, and anxiety and uncertainty around how public transportation is going to deal with their own cleaning and sanitizing protocols. And so some companies are thinking about, you know, instead of moving more downtown, maybe moving out to, you know, where, where the people live and, and whatnot. So, uh, you know, I think it's all over the board. I think they're really, I think they're really uh, uh, investing more heavily in, in their janitorial services, but they're also reconsidering their, uh, their HVAC and, and how the spaces are ventilated and, how to perhaps bring in more fresh air on a more frequent basis. And so the indoor air quality is being completely uh, re, uh, reimagined or, or, or revisited. And so I think, you know, organizations are really all over the board when it comes to how they're trying to prepare and, 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 and create, um, you know, again, create that, that safe uh, working experience. Certainly. Yeah, we're certainly hearing uh, a lot on the HVAC front, indeed, especially as systems, some have been down or at partial capacity. So mm -hmm. that's a really good point. Uh, one question I received from Alita Jones. Hi, Alita. Recommendations for materials and fabrics for new offices. Do you have any for cleaning and acoustics? So one yeah. thing is just make sure that you're reaching out to the different vendors or providers that you already have or you're looking for. Um, no matter what the industry, we've all had to go back and look at what cleaners are available, what cleaners are being used, recommendations for the products we have. Uh, certainly cleaning uh, is a big conversation. Antimicrobial is another conversation and really takes a lot of reading to understand what you're doing there. So just Approach that one with caution because I think that was uh, an immediate jump for a lot of people. Um, but there are some risks associated with that as well. So just really reach out to the team um, and help understand what the different products that are available. And then with the cleaning, as we talk about return to work, make sure that the cleaners that you're using are suitable for the products you're using them on so you don't void warranties or damage products down the road. Absolutely. Following uh, manufacturer guidelines and the data sheets are very, very important, as yep. most of us are finding. Um, let's see. Outside of the preparation, other proactive activities to the physical, which is HVAC, space reallocation, elevator reprogramming, what are the best tools for a facility manager to use and to anticipate behavioral challenges upon reentry? Do you have any feedback or an action plan how to respond like I really liked John you touched on you know like people just trying not to hug each other and there's things that like some people are genuinely anxious about having to um, deny a handshake or something like yeah. that so yeah. is there anything like that um, that an FM can use as a tool um, to help kind of curb that and you know not police but let's call it an action plan yeah. to respond <laughs> Yeah, and that's a tough one because I mean we we have been isolated for so long, and a lot of our our choices have been taken away, right? We um, and so people just want to get together. They want to be near one another, and so uh, I think the only thing we can do is just continue to remind people of the importance of 
uh, you know, personal hygiene and, and uh, wearing the appropriate uh, equipment. Uh, and of course, just again, trying to maintain that, that physical distance. Uh, um, and, and certainly some groups, and I think it, it could be um, you know, if there's temperature being, uh, you know, temperature screening being put in place. Um, and, and if people are, are self-monitoring themselves, you know, I, it, it, again, it, a lot of it's going to be based on the culture. Uh, some cultures are going to be fine with it. Others are going to be like, you know, I you know, really want to get together and, and share lunch. Well, they may just need to bring their own lunches and not share, you know, make a, a casserole for everyone. You know, everyone may not feel comfortable in that. So, you know, in this time, I think we need to just think about things in a, in a different manner that we can still get together. We can still break bread and, and share a meal, but maybe it's just uh, in a little bit different way. You know, that we're, let's hope that this isn't the new normal. Let's just hope that this is a, a something that, uh, will just be a, a blip in time that we can then get back to how things were before of, of you know, maintaining relationships. And, and really, uh, I think that's, that's what a lot of groups are hoping for. But for now, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're all going to have to be responsible and respect everyone and everyone's, uh, you know, everyone is different. Everyone has a different perspective and, and, and feeling about this. Some are eager to get back. Some are not very eager. Some don't want to go back because of, their own personal health issues or, or whatnot. So we just need to understand that everyone is in a different, uh, a different perspective and, and need to respect that. And, and uh, I, I think we'll, we'll get through this. We always, we always do. We always will. Certainly. Another one on the topic of behavior is how do you recommend FMs respond to overwhelming and conflicting requests from onsite staff? So you might have your, sort of protocols in place and you're following that and maybe you're getting even leadership to, um, you know, submit requests and work orders that aren't aligned with um, even just the COVID response, but it could be all over the map. Like the FMs, I feel our industry is going to be in a very awkward and is already in a very awkward position, I should say, and um, responding to these conflicting requests. So do you, to recommend a strategy and how to manage and um, respond to that. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question and, and a tough one again because I think a lot of it is it, a lot of it is based on culture. Uh, certainly, some are are more willing to follow the rules and regulations as set by you know different um, different agencies. And certainly, if leadership has adopted and is on board then the rest of the organization will usually follow suit. When it is conflicting like that, it does make it much more difficult. Um, you know, I don't know if it's possible to, to try to bring in human resources as a way to help. Um, you know, certainly it always helps when you have an executive sponsor because that's the person who says, you know, this is why we're going to do what we're going to do, why it's important for the organization, why it's important for you as employees and ultimately for our customers. Uh, and so I, I think there just needs to be, I think, an agreement, but also an understanding that can things perhaps flex and change, perhaps, um, but I, I think it's a case by case basis as long and I, if the company agrees that there are certain things that we're not going to bend on, that I think will help quite a bit. Um, but again, when it comes to some of the other, uh, a lot of the other requests, it's hard. I mean, it's, you know, facility managers and facilities design teams really shouldn't be the ones that have to police all of these things. It really should come from executive leadership, HR, um, and facilities together. Yeah, certainly having that united front is very important and having that consistent message that is always going back um, to staff is really important. I think just like this is all just showing the critical role that we all play in making sure that we do have a safe and like comfortable return back as comfortable mm -hmm. as it can be. But one day we will all be looking back and we can all brag that we worked in facility management at the time <laughs> of the coronavirus. That's yeah, right. I, think that's, I think you're earning some stripes there, which is pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a question here from JB Benjamin. Hello there, JB. Are our members returning to shared office space, so such as the Regis's and the WeWorks of the world, um, where we have no control over the building FM and there have been notifications of confirmed cases in the building in recent months? Our company has opted out 
but opted to not return to our shared offices or even our dedicated buildings we own in the near future. Our team in Toronto has been even more productive working from home, 100% as opposed to 70, 75% remote in the past. So really around these, um, these shared spaces, and I mean, we've pre-COVID, like the increase of these co-working spaces and the attractability of them and um, what what do you see? Do you see the um, the Regis's and the WeWorks of the world? Do you see them um, kind of, or do you think it's gonna be a lull or do you think maybe it just comes down to them having a lot of enhanced cleaning and things like that? Like what, what do you think um, is, if you looked into your Hayworth crystal ball, <laughs> what would you guess? Right. Yeah, that's that's another one that we certainly will watch, um, and and it's it's one that will it's almost a to be determined. And I think they're even still still trying to figure it out for themselves. But I think the the, the idea of, of providing a third place for people to use outside of the home or the workplace um, is still an attractive uh, amenity for some, and I think it still will be relevant in the future. Uh, will they? not grow as much as they had in the past, perhaps. Uh, it could be, uh, they could slow down with, with some of their growth, but they certainly, I think, will take on a, a higher focus on cleaning and sanitizing, and that, that will just, that will have to be in place, and it'll have to be communicated, and it'll have to be demonstrated, and perhaps with the use of technology, uh, they, uh, they can leverage that a little bit, but I know some companies are actually putting QR codes everywhere so that if there is an issue, an employee can actually take a picture of the QR code with their, their phone. Mm -hmm. And then that information goes directly to whether it's facilities or whomever the appropriate, you know, uh, uh, group is to address the issue right away. So little things like that could, could help as well. But I think there's still, there's still an opportunity to leverage those types of spaces in the future how you know whether they grow or shrink wow it's really it's really hard to know right now i agree I mean, oh sorry go for it nicole i'm gonna say sorry locally what i've seen in some cases is that individuals rather than using it as a shared space is so many offices today have hoteling or their own type of collab space um <laughs> in the environment unassigned desks are just not very favorable at this time. So if there is an organization that has staff that really want to be back in the office and they don't have the ability, what I've seen happening is in some cases, um, some of these smaller co-working spaces have been leasing out an entire space to one company and that being a better step forward rather than having shared lunch rooms or shared meeting spaces, it all goes to one organization or in some cases, building has been delayed uh, on a space they were gonna move into and they need to leave their space. So these co-working spaces are filling a gap right now in that need. So we're not seeing them go away, but maybe the intended use has changed. Certainly, yeah, I don't foresee them going away myself. And I mean, I think it's like what we have been talking about and what um, both you, Nicole, and John have been talking about with layouts. I mean, you have the Regis's of the world that are typically more traditional and have separate offices and they're self-contained. And then um, the WeWorks and others um, tend to be a bit more open and collaborative, but there are furniture solutions around that that they could look into, of course. Everything comes down to everyone's comfort level at the end of the day yeah. right now. And that's whether you're going into work or you're deciding to go to a patio. Yeah. That's in phase two. Right. Um, another question. Some facility managers are seeing PPE, hand sanitizer, and other cleaning products intended to be utilized by on-site staff being stolen and brought home by employees. How do you recommend facility managers respond to similar situations? Another behavioral one for you. Yeah, that's, that's another tough one. Um, and again, I think a lot of it, again, comes down to culture. It's, it's, it is amazing how much culture impacts and influences so much about how we work and how we interact with one another, but um, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I really, you don't really want to lock those things up. You want to be able to give people access to those cleaning stations so that they can either that, or you, you make sure that you have uh, individuals visibly present and out cleaning all the time so that they don't have to uh, clean themselves or you're not clean themselves. I'm sorry, but clean their, their spaces that they're, they're occupying themselves. So, that could be one workaround, but um, you know, outside of, of that, I, I, 
I don't know what the best way to prevent that from happening. It's, it's unfortunate and it's too bad that we can't, that people feel the need to do that because they can't get it anywhere else. Um, so I would say, you know, I, a lot of it is just maybe again, communicating and, and asking uh, those to, you know, respect the, uh, you know, the, the products for, for everyone and, and to, you know, understand that, you know, this is needed for the greater whole and not just for you and your, your home. Mark, some glitter bombs with hand sanitizer boxes. You only have to have a couple and it won't happen again. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> glitter bombs. I glitter said bombs. glitter there bombs, you hand sanitizer boxes and, and that's it. It won't happen anymore. It certainly draws right. some attention. That is for sure. But in all seriousness, I think it does come back to um, what you've been talking about in responding to behavioral challenges and anticipating these things. And ideally, we hope to see the best in humanity at, at such a challenging time, but um, we'll just have to address it as it comes. Yeah. I am cognizant of timing, um, so I'm going to put out one last question. How do you recommend that facility managers get a seat at the table when it comes to the reentry st strategy and help influence this new normal? And when I say that, I mean a lot of organizations um, maybe historically haven't really been having the FM at the table when it comes to things like a new construction project or um, other issues that a company surrounds. But how, um, how do you ensure, or how do you, um, how do you think it's best that a facility manager can empower themselves to try to get that seat at the table or even somehow get their way in? Is there something that you would recommend? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really great question too. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would like to think that if they aren't at the table now or before they will be now in the, in the future. So, um, you know, obviously the, the janitorial services, the cleaning, the sanitizing, all of that is now taking on a new, new higher focus and as well as the, the de-densification of the floor plan, uh, how to manage circulation into and out of spaces uh, is, is uh, also taking on a, a higher focus. So it, I, would, I would like to think that they, they should be involved in, in, in order to help get themselves seat, I would say, do some research, uh, start developing a strategy based on the facility itself, look at all things, and almost develop a day-in-the-life scenario for an employee, how mm -hmm. they get to work, how they enter this, uh, the facility, how they get to the floor, their, their workspace, uh, where they collaborate, where they, you know, so walking it through and developing that sort of a day-in-the-life profile might help to give some shed some light on things that perhaps the executive team may not have considered or thought about. But I would also encourage you to reach out to other organizations and understand what their strategies are and, and, and what, what plans they're developing and perhaps learn and uh, adopt some of those elements as well that you can bring to the table and say, hey, look, I've, I've talked to five other organizations and uh, they're doing some things differently that we haven't considered. Maybe we, and so I think that will just give, that will show the, uh, the value that uh, facility managers, why they're so valuable and, and, and how they can add additional value to this, this new strategy. And feel free to use the culture types. I mean, of yeah. course, when you're dealing with your leadership team. What culture type are they? Use yeah. that as part of your approach when you're coming up with the solution to make sure it's most successful. Yeah, that's a great point because certainly if you have a, a very yellow collaborate culture, they're going to want to share stories and, and, and emotions, you know, so how you deliver your communication might want to change for that group versus those that are in blue are going to want just the facts, right? So bullet points, they don't need the whole picture. They just need, give it, give it to me bullet, you know, just the facts where reds, the control, they like a lot of detail. So explain things in sequential order from A to Z, because that's really how they think. And then those in green that are more visionary leaders, they, they may need to see, more, more visionary, visional, visionary or, or uh, visual representations of, of the idea or concepts. I did, that might also help with their, uh, so how you, who your, who your audience is, you can start to adapt your, your communication style and tailor it to meet their, their uh, cultural um, characteristic. Certainly, thank you.
Well, thank you again to Nicole and Jonna Hayworth for today's presentation, Active Discussion. We do need support like this from the FM community in order to continue to facilitate excellent programming, even from our home offices. We will post today's recording to our YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining and participating. If you need contact information, if you don't have a pen on the fly right now to reach out to John and Nicole, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to connect you. Lastly, if my Toronto and South Central Ontario would like to thank all of you that are working on the front lines as essential workers. We couldn't get through this period without you. Take care, stay healthy, and keep in touch. Bye, everyone.